Welcome, happy Grace Hopper Celebration for Women in Computing to everybody. Um, I'm Emily Olin, I'm the Director of Marketing and Communications at the Linux Foundation. Um, and what we are gonna talk about today is a little bit about some of the cool careers there are in open source. So for those who don't know what open source is, it's a bunch of companies working together to develop shared software that anybody can use. It's free to use, anybody can contribute. The communities that are out there are open to everybody. So if, in terms of diversity and inclusion, this is a real opportunity to level the playing field. You kind of get out what you put in. Um, a lot of open source communities are working hard on diversity and inclusion efforts. I'd say some are farther along than others. But in terms of getting involved, most, most communities are very welcoming and want people to contribute. Some of the benefits that come from open source or participating in it is you'll get real work experience uh, working on a larger project. You develop skills that can help advance your career. Networking opportunities are fantastic. You are working alongside software developers and engineers from major tech companies, telco companies, retailers, if you're in the motion picture industry working with across, uh, working with all the studios. And then these people see the work that you're doing and this can lead to job opportunities as well. Um, and then depending on how, your level of involvement and how much you wanna be involved, essentially you could join the TSC and help guide the roadmap for the project as well. So there's a lot here. You can get involved at any level, technical, non-technical, most projects even just need help with documentation. Um, and there's no set amount of time. So as much or as little as you wanna give is great. So about the Linux Foundation, so we are home to hundreds of these open source projects and foundations. They cross all sorts of technologies and industries, you know, from the tech that you've got blockchain, edge computing, IoT, networking, cloud computing, uh, infotainment, visual effects, animation. Most of the Fortune 500 is using open source software somewhere in their business. So you, there's huge opportunity to go anywhere you want within this. Most industries are using it, automotive, motion picture, retail, healthcare, finance, energy, um, even more. So there's a lot of opportunities. It's a good starting point for getting involved in many different technologies, industries, however you wanna take your career. Today, we wanna tell you about just a few of some of the cool careers that we think are out there. So we've got women from Netflix, Industrial Light and Magic, Walmart, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, they're gonna talk about how they got their start, the role that open source has played in their career development and how their companies use open source software. After that, we've got Mary from the Linux Foundation is gonna talk about some training opportunities and how you can learn more about open source. And then we'll do a live Q&A. So um, feel free to type your questions in the Q&A box. You can be upvoted. So towards the end, we'll do the live Q&A and kind of pick some of those top questions to ask out. Feel free to use the chat. Uh, we are very excited to have everybody here. And now I'm going to turn it over to our first speaker, who is Carol Payne from Netflix. Hi, everybody. Good morning, afternoon, evening from all over the world. I'm really excited to be here with everybody today. Um, like Emily said, my name is Carol Payne, and I am an imaging specialist at Netflix. Um, on, our, on our studio side, I work on a team called Creative Technologies, which is really... Um, an R&D focused team, R&D and standards focused team for how do Netflix original productions get made and what technology gets them there. Um, but it's been a long road to get here. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about my background, where I came from, how I learned about open source, which I'll be honest, more than 50% of my time at Netflix, around thereabouts, I'm using or working on open source technology for Netflix. And it's incredible and great, but uh, honestly, I haven't been doing it for very long. So I started um, majoring in film and digital media and uh, minoring in computer science at the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque. Um, it was a new film program that, uh, you know, was just kind of getting its, getting its feet wet and figuring out what it was gonna be. Um, it still is new. And, you know, the, the cool thing about the program was that 
it was interdisciplinary and cohort based. So I took one class with my cohort every semester, but the rest of the classes, you could kind of, to a certain extent, form your own degree and figure out what you were interested in and take classes that sounded uh, really cool to you. And that was really fun for me and it enabled me to kind of just discover lots of things. Originally, I was interested mostly in animation, but by the end of my degree, I really had fallen in love with visual effects. So um, after college, I worked for a small visual effects company in Albuquerque doing whatever they asked me to do. Um, and uh, not too long after that, about a year after that, I landed an entry level job as a technical assistant at Industrial Light and Magic in San Francisco. And there I did, uh, you know, lots of different stuff, uh, uh, watching the, the render queue, render wrangling, uh, data management of all of our storage uh, for all of the projects that ILM had going on. Um, I did basic level scripting and really just learned about the visual effects pipeline and, and what it meant and the opportunity uh, and all of the different careers that you could have. And it was really then that I started to see um, what open source even was, I didn't really learn about it in college. Um, it wasn't, it wasn't a thing that I uh, experienced truly. Um, but once I got to ILM and you started to see all of these different things that were coming from all these different places, um, it was really obvious pretty immediately that the industry was incredibly collaborative and depended on um, everybody contributing their best work from every direction in order to make these amazing movies and products succeed. Um, eventually at ILM, I worked my way up through the ranks and landed in a field called color science, which is sort of a niche within a niche. Um, and, you know, it's, it's funny, color science is this sort of, a lot of people look at it as this sort of black box industry that is this sort of some magic that no one knows anything about. And most studios and companies in our industry have one and maybe two color scientists if they're lucky. And um, I was fascinated in this thing that was so interesting and fun, but that no one seemed to know anything about. So I had some great mentors at ILM that taught me uh, and got me started and um, let me learn efficiently and, and sort of opened my eyes to what was possible. Um, and then I came to Netflix um, and I've been at Netflix for about a year and a half now. And like I said before, I spend about 50% of my time working on open source software and all of those standards. And em Emily talked about the Linux Foundation and particularly um, underneath that, I've started working pretty heavily with the Academy Software Foundation, which is a partnership between the Linux Foundation and the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, which was founded out of a need uh, to really, uh, to, to, that because, the industry realized that we all depend so much on open source software for every movie that we make and everything that we do. And so we realized that some sort of governance model to increase the quality and quantity of open source contributions was really necessary to move forward and make sure that the work that was being contributed and used on all these projects was consistent um, and you know, valuable and that a lot of the like structure and legal guidance was taken care of so that the contributors can focus on the technology and what they're contributing. And the ASWF um, and guided by the Linux Foundation enables us to do that, to focus on the work that we're doing. So a couple of the projects that I work on open source are a part of the ASWF, one of which is uh, Open Color IO, which is, uh, you know, a color library, color management framework library that's used in almost every visual effects and animation application today for their management of color and what it means uh, on your screen and your images um, and as you interact with it. Um, yeah, so, so along those lines, um, ASWF has been really crucial to standardize, create renewed interest in open source in our industry and so much more. And at Netflix, it's been such a joy for me um, to work on this and to really be a, a company that realizes that in order to scale and enable storytellers all over the globe to create the content that they want to, you have to 
you really need to democratize and standardize the tools and technology that we use and open source is one of the ways that we do that. If we can standardize and enable everybody to have access to this technology, then creatives spend more time actually creating and less time figuring out how they're going to do it. And that is the goal over and over again. And for me, it's been really amazing to see I work directly on two open source projects, Open Colorado that I mentioned. I also work on the Academy uh, Color Encoding System or ACES, which is a way to uh, manage your, you know, view your color through the pipeline in a standardized way from end to end. And those two projects, you know, most, most movies wouldn't be made without them today. And to have a way to work on those and contribute those in a in a way that connects me and re and Emily was talking a lot about the networking opportunities. I will say again and again that I wish that I had known about open source when I was in college or earlier, because the networking opportunities and how much I have learned in my two and a half years of being involved in uh, these open source projects is so amazing. And the people that are involved in these projects, they're, they're so passionate and dedicated to making the future of our industry strong and the products that we use the best that they can possibly be. They're so open and willing to teach. So the last thing that I'll say is get involved. Um, look up the Academy Software Foundation. If you have an interest in working in movies, reach out, let us know. Um, Rachel's also gonna talk just in a second about her career. I had the opportunity to work with her for five years at ILM and she's a great mentor to me. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to her. Thanks, Carol. <laughs> so, hi, I'm Rachel Rose. I'm really, really excited to be here today to talk about the work, how I got here, and how it relates to open source software. Now, I developed technology at Industrial Light and Magic, or ILM, the visual effects division of Lucasfilm, which you heard Carol talk about and where we got the opportunity to work together. Now, ILM works on a lot of different films. We have made fully animated feature films like Ringo, um, lots of giant robot movies like the Transformers movies, and shows with a ton of human-like creatures like the superheroes in uh, the Avengers films. But of course, ILM is best known for Star Wars, which we have been making for the last 40 years. Now, I specifically co-supervise and manage a department called Research and Development, or R&D. I've been a part of R&D now for about 13 years, first as a software engineer and now as a supervisor. Um, R&D is responsible for creating tools that our artists use to make the visual effects that end up on the big screen. Now, no matter how many different movies we do at ILM, each and every one of them presents some new technical challenge that needs to be addressed. It's one of the most exciting things about what I do. And Lucasfilm has a long-standing tradition of innovating to solve these challenges. Now, many of these innovations rely heavily on a common foundation of open source software that is used throughout our industry. Now, I consider it a mix of luck and really hard work that I've been able to make a career out of working on cutting edge technology as a part of the film industry. Um, I've been able to be a part of amazing organizations like the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences and the Academy Software Foundation, which grew out of the Academy Software and Technology Council to support open source projects that our industry relies heavily on, as Carol was mentioning. Now, like I said, um, getting to where I am has definitely included some luck, but also a huge amount of hard work. Now, for me, that hard work really started early on when I found my preteen self watching TV shows about the movie magic of Terminator 2 and the Abyss um, on one day, and then the very next day working through code examples on the printed on the back of magazines. And by working through those code examples, I mean working through them in my head because I didn't actually have a computer at home. Now, later when I went to college, I chose a small liberal arts college in Iowa called Grinnell College, um, thinking that I'd get my bachelor's degree in computer science there, and then I'd go to law school. Now, it's at Grinnell that I was actually first introduced to the concept of open source software. The idea seemed remarkable to me, honestly. Um, getting people together from all walks of life to jointly write software that others could use for free <laughs> to create even bigger software systems. Now, this collaborative nature of 
computer science is what really sold me on getting my PhD in computer science instead of going to law school. Um, I spent six years in graduate school getting my PhD in human motion generation. Um, the goal of much of my research was to take existing human motion that was either captured on a motion capture stage or hand animated by an animator and to produce new novel motions that retained um, the quality of the originals. Now, throughout my PhD, I depended heavily on open source libraries, which meant I didn't have to code my own implementation of matrix math or invent a file format that would represent motion capture data so that I could do processing on it. And I could really focus on novel contributions that I would then be able to in turn share with others who could further build on top of them. Now, considering my love of collaboration, it's no surprise to anyone that knows ILM that I ended up there. Um, ILM is practically founded on the idea of collaboration and it's an environment where art mixes with science and good ideas really do come from anywhere. Um, within our R&D group, we spend a ton of time talking with artists about problems, brainstorming ideas on how to solve those problems, um, and building on past work to push innovation forward. Uh, and a big part of that is the use of open source software every day. So I'm going to give you a few examples of some of the things that we use open source software uh, with um, in the VFX industry, so, and, and specifically at ILM. Now, Carol talked um, a bit about Open Color I.O., and it is hugely important for us at ILM as well. Uh, it really is a full color management system that allows us to get great looking color to the big screen. Open Color I.O. helped us on Rise of Skywalker, for instance, to seamlessly blend elements of ray in front of a green screen with the desert planet of Fasana. It also helped um, us get color match in the scenes that were depicting young Leia and young Luke in training. But those sequences really depended heavily on being able to believably blend archival footage with new plates. Um, another example of a project that we use extensively uh, is OpenEXR. It's, a, it's an interesting project for us because it actually was originally developed at ILM and then later released in 2003, um, which was before my time at the company as an open source image file format for professional use. Now, as a developer, um, being able to use OpenEXR as a library means that I can create exciting new image processing algorithms that need a multi-channel image representation and trust that those images can come from a variety of different sources, even sources that aren't internal. So those multiple channels can encode varied data including depth data that helps us create a final frame for a movie uh, from light layered images. For instance, in a movie like Bumblebee, um, OpenEXR's multi-channel format was used to layer an image of Bumblebee being dragged along the ground with other EXR images of sparks, smoke, dust, all the things around him. Now, in our code at ILM, we also use a slew of other open source libraries, um, just to name a few uh, in, in case you recognize the names or are interested in other open source libraries that we do use, um, some of them more than others. Uh, we use a, a library called Alembic as an application independent interchange format for baked geometry. Um, we use Pixar's open source USD library to uh, help compose scene descriptions in certain circumstances. And we use OpenVDB uh, for representing and processing volumetric data. Now, everyone, uh, uh, every one of these projects that I just mentioned um, are true open source projects. Anyone with an interest can dig into the code that makes up the project and contribute, in effect, leveling the playing field, as Emily said. You know, open source directly embraces the idea that computer science is only enhanced by working with others with diverse views. That brings me to another thing that I feel extraordinarily lucky to be able to do as a part of my career. Um, since open source software is only as good as its community, the ASWF decided to take the might of its members to move the needle on the problem of lack of diversity. Now this summer, the foundation formed a new diversity and inclusion working group that Carol and I signed on to co-chair. So now I get to work with her again, which is awesome. <laughs> While issues of diversity are not going to change overnight, the ASWF is in a unique position to provide much needed resources for engagement. I'm excited to be a part of it, and that is only made possible by my career at ILM and my involvement in the open source community. Now with that, I will pass this off to our next speaker so you can learn more about some of the other cool careers in open source. Wonderful. Thank you, Rachel. Um, 
I'd like to, uh, first of all, um, this is my fourth Grace Hopper that I've gone to. My name is Daniela Bar Barbosa. I'm the Vice President at Worldwide Alliances here at Hyperledger. Um, I started going to Grace Hopper about 10 years ago when one of my great mentors, one of my one and only mentors, Penny Hersher, who was on the board of the Anita Borg uh, for, since the beginning, um, invited me. And for those of you who have been to Grace Hopper in person, you've walked in and you felt the energy of a room full of women technologists working with each other and the excitement that it feels. And this morning, I have to say, when I saw all 500 of you coming in and saying good morning and where you were from and your beautiful names and the regions you were going to, I had that same feeling. So thank you for joining us. Um, super excited to see that even this virtual event, we all get the feeling of being together and having this opportunity. It is uh, my great honor um, to introduce uh, one of the women leaders in our blockchain community here at Hyperledger. Hyperledger is part of the Linux Foundation focused on enterprise blockchain. And um, it is a fantastic community. We'll talk a little bit about how you can get involved um, as we go through this. Uh, but it's my great honor to introduce to you Archana Shritsi, who's the Senior Director of Engineering for Blockchain Platforms at Walmart. Um, she has over 20 years of technology experience across many different sectors, financial, automotive, and obviously the retail industry. Um, at Walmart, she leads a team of engineers, many who we have the privilege here at Hyperledger to work with directly. Uh, that design and implement blockchain uh, for driving transparency in food supply chains. Um, and you know, for those of you who eat, that is a very important part of keeping your food supply uh, safe um, and also very important for the food produ producers themselves to be successful in the farms and in the work that they do. Um, at Hyperledger, uh, I'm also honored to work very closely with Archana as she is the representative of the general membership. So there's about 200 general member companies companies that she represents on our governing board um, and is a great advocate for uh, companies small and big around the world that are participants in the Hyperledger community. Um, Archana, I would love to send it over to you um, if you can talk a little bit about you, how you got to where you are today. Um, and um, thank you so much once again, everyone. Uh, Archana. Thank you. Thank you, Daniela. I hope everybody can hear me. Uh, it's such a pleasure and honor to be here uh, with you all today. I have never been in a gathering of so many uh, women before. So this is, I, I'm absolutely freaking out right now. This is, this is one of the best meetings I've ever attended. Um, I am a technologist by trade. I've been uh, in this business for about 20 years now, over 20 years now. I started off as a software engineer, uh, consulting with many different companies. I've worked in, like Daniela said, I've worked in, uh, uh, a few industries like automotive, financial, and now retail. Uh, it's been really, really exciting ride. Tough at times. I'm not gonna deny that. It's been, uh, but it's been a good ride so far. Um, at, well, I joined Walmart nine years ago. I had no idea what retail is, uh, but I had been a technologist all my life, and it's been, uh, you know, it's been fascinating just learning about where technology touches every facet of our life and how we can influence and build um, better experiences for our customers by use of technology. And blockchain is one such area that I'm very, very passionate about. I got involved in blockchain in 2016. So Walmart announced uh, two proof of concepts in 2016 uh, for using blockchain. One was a pilot that we announced in China and one was in US, both focused around how can we apply blockchain as a technology to improve food safety and um, you know, remove any kind of bad products from our supply chain and be able to prove, prove out results very quickly. Most of you may know blockchain as a technology that underpins Bitcoin. That's what I knew about blockchain when I got into it. I didn't know how blockchain could be enterprise, could be applied to uh, enterprises for, for conducting their business. So, we started on this journey in 2016 and it's it's been two you know it's been quite quite a few years already and i'm happy to report that we're seeing great results with this already um so we started with um two proof of concepts like i mentioned and uh in us we 
we did the POC with seven of our suppliers and two of our competitors to test and learn how can this technology really scale and help us achieve our business outcomes. And after, after we got positive results, we were able to see that we can trace back, uh, you know, the products back to their farm in a matter of seconds. So in two, 2018, we formally launched uh, an initiative with our suppliers, picking up one section of our produce, which is leafy greens, and sending out a letter to our suppliers that let's get your data added to the blockchain. And in 2019, we expanded this initiative to include other categories of produce like green bell, bell pepper suppliers. And as of right now, majority of our suppliers from Leafy Green have already uh, onboarded and added the data to the blockchain, which helps us pinpoint where um, some product may be getting contaminated, how to remove them faster from the shelf, and how to bring back the full farm to store traceability to these uh, products. We've also conducted other pilots within the pharmaceutical industry. There's regulations in pharma that require us to do uh, track and trace of pharmaceutical drugs to prevent any kind of counterfeit drugs from entering the US supply chain. So it's pretty um, um, interesting and, and, and massive at the same time to understand how can you use a technology that is kind of hard to understand initially, but touches a part of our life that we all understand, right? We all buy the food from the stores. We all hear about these recalls throughout the year. How can it help us uh, uh, improve that experience of the customer by removing those products much faster from the supply chain and working with the authorities whenever there's a recall? So for me, that has been the most fascinating part because telling my kids what blockchain is, right? Uh, we go shopping for groceries together and uh, it's been interesting just trying to explain to them, I can, uh, you know, the kind of work that, that we do can help us pinpoint the farm where the products may be coming from. There is that abundance in food. Uh, we sell a lot of food every day. Understanding, uh, you know, the, the high volume of product that we move and tracing them back is a huge challenge by itself. So as we got more and more engaged with blockchain technology, we realize that there's a whole community of open source developers that are working on this to make it better every day. And what we realize as a company and as a team is that staying involved with the open source communities will further transform the future of our business. So you think about it, it's, 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 like, a, it's like iterations of different um, code that are being rolled out every day, every year. There's a whole technical steering committee that's working on this, there's a whole, open source community of developers that is working on this. And we realize the only way we can shape the outcome of this is by staying engaged and bringing perspectives of all uh, different types of players is very, very important with an open source community. You could have uh, service providers that are uh, building this. You could have engineers, you could have banking experts working on this and understanding perspectives of all the players and all the companies that are building this is very, very important. And it also opens up a door to being, you know, having diversity of thought when you're building it. And that's one of the reasons the way we got engaged in this. So we became a member of Hyperledger in, um, I wanna say spring this year. Um, and just the massive amount of knowledge that me and my team have gained on open source community has opened up my eyes. And I asked myself, why didn't I get engaged in this sooner? Uh, like Daniela said, I sit on the um, Hyperledger Governance Board. It's an elected position. And I'm not gonna lie, I got an email about the elections and I wasn't sure that I wanted to um, you know, apply. But then I thought long and hard about it that either you're all in or you're not. And then I actually went, took the step and I applied It's an elected position, like I said. And uh, it's, it's, been a, it's been a great learning experience for all. And I also have team members who are um, engaged with the open source communities um, in, in their own local chapters. We have teams all over the world. Um, so staying engaged with the local chapters, networking, understanding different perspectives of all the players that are involved in this, in this community and actually building your skills is, is a great opportunity that I hope you all will also uh, avail at some point. And with that, I will pass it on to our next speaker.
Great. Well, thank you, Archana. Um, really appreciate it. We're going to stick around for some questions afterwards as well. Um, and next, we'd like to call up uh, Priyana. Priyanka. Oh, there you go. Awesome. Thank you so much. I am so honored to be here. Uh, Grace Hopper has been this amazing experience and place that I've always aspired to be at uh, for as long as I can remember. And to be here speaking to you all today is a great honor. So today I thought I'd use my time to share with you a little bit of who I am, what I do in open source and just how I got there. In addition to that though, uh, I've made some notes here, so I'm like looking here really quickly. Um, in addition to that, I do wanna to talk to you about some myths about working in open source, about getting involved with open source. And finally, uh, some steps, my, our organization, Cloud Native Computing Foundation, which is under the umbrella of Linux Foundation, is taking to support education, mentoring, and um, uh, scholarships. So let's get started. So as I said, I am Priyanka and I am the general manager of uh, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. None of that may make sense to most people. Uh, my family is one of those people who have only recently started understanding what it is that I do. So the Cloud Native Computing Foundation is the home for some of the most critical software infrastructure projects out there. Um, so most of you must have heard of cloud computing, which uh, Amazon Web Services uh, really brought to the forefront in 2014, I think it was. With the widespread adoption of cloud computing, there was a rise in a different way of building software that could be faster and more resilient uh, so that companies could build features really quickly and delight their customers. And that's what it's all about in the end, right? Being responsive to the people you serve. So cloud computing enabled a different way of developing software, which is known as cloud native computing. Um, the key technologies that enable this, the number one is Kubernetes. Kubernetes is a is a container management platform. So containers, uh, if uh, most of you might have heard of them, they're basically, they contain applications uh, or pieces of applications that can be spun up and down on compute resources so that you can be more efficient. Uh, with Kubernetes, which started, uh, was started as a project at Google and then open sourced uh, and then brought to CNCF, container orchestration became widespread and also the ability to use different kinds of uh, cloud providers, different kinds of uh, ancillary tools for uh, tooling for your entire software development lifecycle. So needless to say, it is critical to um, all, all of software development out there today. CNCF, Cloud Native Computing Foundation, hosts Kubernetes and many other projects that support this wave of modern software development is just faster, more resilient, more responsive. Uh, we have today over 70 plus projects and because of the essentialness of these projects, we actually have the largest community of end users. End users are folks who deploy such software uh, in our ecosystem. Over 140 companies are part of us, uh, our end user community, and over 550 companies are part of our membership circle. Um, and these are not vanity metrics. These are important metrics because they tell you just the momentum this, uh, this space has in the ecosystem. So I got involved about, uh, I've had a long, all my career has been in tech, but not all of it has been in distributed systems or cloud native. About five, six, six years ago, uh, sorry, was it seven? <laughs> it's hard to remember. I, um, I decided I wanted to do a startup of my own and I went off and built some various projects with a co-founder and the one that stuck was a dev tool. It was a time tracker for people to manage, um, to see what their coding activity was. In that we had open source plugins. So you could have a plugin for your text editor of choice, whether it's like, I don't know, NetBeans or IntelliJ or Atom or uh, Sublime, whatever. Um, and that was my first exposure, very accidental, kind of like how other speakers before were saying, uh, very accidental to open source. But the minute I touched it, I had this feeling of energy, excitement, inclusion that I had not felt before in my previous career in tech. That is not to say there are not great places that are close, to, close source to work at, but that was just my experience. And that got me hooked. I developed my... Um, 
knowledge uh, by just being more and more involved. When you're doing a startup, you're in it to win it and you do everything you can. And that open source community really took me in. Over time, um, that startup went nowhere, but <laughs> I started um, working with other developer tool companies just to help them with their go-to market, help them with um, getting more developers involved. Uh, so I became an advisor at an accelerator in San Francisco called Heavybit, where they have series A companies that have some product and some traction and really want to figure it out. Uh, and I learned so much about so many dev tools. That's where I was really fortunate to meet um, some folks who had built critical infrastructure at Google uh, around the observability space. So when you have a complex distributed system, it's very hard to understand exactly where problems are because no one person really knows what's going on in the whole thing. It's too complex. And so uh, these folks had built something called Dapper and Monarch at Google, which, are, uh, which do distributed tracing and uh, uh, monitoring metri uh, metrics at Google in production. And I learned from the, these really amazing teachers all the details that I needed to know about how do distributed systems operate, when they should be in place, how, what are the challenges people face. That was the exciting time about four years ago when Kubernetes was becoming really exciting. CNCF had just been formed. Um, and I spent a lot of my time working on an open source project they were building called Open Tracing. With Open Tracing, I just had had first dived into the cloud native ecosystem that was open source. And I have to say, I mean, today, cloud native and open source is really strategic to big businesses. It career, like your career gets, your resume gets a huge boost if you have this on your resume. Colleagues are awesome, pay is good. That's not, but the real reason I got hooked in was the type of people who I surrounded myself with. I knew nothing about systems when I got involved and people were only kind, helpful, supportive. They hooked me up to opportunities hit for like, hey Priyanka, go talk to this person. Hey, do that. And that energy sucked me in. So for anyone out there who is intimidated, just take the first step and you'll see a lot of awesome happen. Um, with that, I got with that experience, I got really embedded into the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. I was educating a lot of end users about what is tracing, doing demos, giving talks, all of that. And my career kept going. I ended up working at a company called GitLab, which is an open core end-to-end um, -end software deliver, delivery lifecycle uh, product. They started as a, a GitHub competitor with um, repos, and then like they added CACD, and now they have the whole suite. And there I did Cloud Native Alliances and evangelism and just immersed myself further. I got elected to the board of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Purely, I mean, it was an election, it just happened for me. I too was nervous about my putting my name in as Archana mentioned, um, but got enough push from colleagues and people in the community that I almost entered my name as a joke actually, because I was like, this is not gonna happen, uh, but it did. And then I served on the board for over a year and finally was approached for this role to lead the CNCF. That's what general manager means. Uh, you're basically leading the foundation, ensuring it is effective, meeting its objectives and staying, um, managing the PNL to make sure you're solvent and a good steward of the money that people entrust in you. Uh, this job, I've been in it for four months and I have to say it's a dream come true. I'm in the community I love, surrounded by the people who enable each other. And we're working on software that literally lifts up the entire world. Everything you touch has some element of cloud native in it today. Uh, I've, I don't know for sure, but I'm fairly certain many of the technologies we're using right now are built on uh, Kubernetes. So that's a little bit about me and where I come from and what I've been doing. Now I wanna talk a little bit about breaking into open source and some myths that come with that. People perceive it to be very hard so let's start with one myth. Only engineers can contribute. I went to school at Stanford uh, University in California and I graduated with a major in political science. Not at all computer science. And I, by chance, my first job was at Google and I ended up in a career in tech, but I've self-taught along the way. Uh, I, when you do a startup, you know, you build websites because you need to, you do whatever you need to do. And then when I got the teachers that I met uh, from um, who taught me about distributed systems, I developed my skills more and more. And today, as the general manager of CNCF, I am not programming every day, but I am managing teams of developers, managing teams of 
um, business people, all of them. And my job is fully in open source. So this is totally false. And this, my path may be super involved, but for someone else, you can host a podcast, even an event planner is a contributor. Every contributed contribution matters. And this is something I've spoken at length about. And I want to tell you that no matter what you have time for, for participating in a cause in any way is useful for your career, for the cause. The second part is it's just too hard to contribute to open source. It's like you need a lot of knowledge and this and that. That's false too. The first contribution you can make is fix a typo in documentation. That's super easy. And the best thing about open source is very much the collaboration and interaction you have with people. So the minute the minute you contribute even the tiniest thing, that con collaboration and conversation starts. And it's a big win. Another myth is you have to get started very early in your career. Like if you didn't start when you were 10 years old, it's over. False. I really started six years ago and it's been going great. There is no time right, time wrong for this. Another myth, which is on the opposite end of the spectrum, is you have to be very, very experienced and know in detail about the Linux kernel or like how container orchestration works to start. Also false. And the same example applies. I started six years ago and here I am. Um, I will not diminish it. I would not like to diminish the contribution of the deeply technical 20, 30 year old, uh, 30 year experience uh, people who have built some of the most critical technology out there. But to get started, you don't need to be there. Another uh, myth is well, open source is free labor for nothing. Absolutely not. It's free labor for everything. Uh, it gives you great mentors, great colleagues, future job opportunities, and a joyous time. What else could be better? So these are just some myths I thought I'd myth bust. Uh, when we do Q and A, happy to talk more about anything that you would like to double click into. So open source, cloud native, all these are great places with good people, good environment, career prospects. What are we doing to help? The cloud native community, uh, computing foundation is focused on getting new folks in. In fact, we host these big, um, flagship events every year called KubeCons. And uh, we did the KubeCon EU virtually uh, a few months, like in August. And 70% of the attendees were first time attendees. So we're making very good progress every year, every quarter on getting more people in the fold. Uh, there are some programs that we run that may be useful for folks. So we do, we have internship programs. We have within uh, the projects, we have contrib contributor experience uh, special interest groups that cater, can work to make the experience good for anyone joining in. We also, as I mentioned, we have big events that we host and small events where you can come and learn. Highly, highly encourage you to do that because the community in these events really enables learning. Um, we, there's a lot of social media support with people jumping in to help people. The other day I got a tweet from someone being like, hey, I need some help finding a mentor in this specific piece. And I was like, yeah, let's go. Um, and I connected them to someone. So there's, the, and I'm not the only one, the whole community is like this. Uh, CNCF also runs a job board and uh, Mary will soon talk to you about more trainings and certifications that we offer for you to really dip your feet into Kubernetes. We also work hard at diversity and have mentorship programs. And there's, that's a long list, right? And so I'm gonna break one tiny rule and <laughs> share my screen really quickly with you and show you this uh, github.com CNCF mentoring. This is where we've listed a lot of mentoring initiatives. Go here if you don't know where else to start and check it out. You'll find options, you'll find people and they'll help you. So uh, I'll put this in the chat as well, CNCF slash CNCF slash mentoring and hopefully this will be useful to you. Uh, with that said, I wanna thank you all for listening. There's 500 of you awesome women and non-binary folks here. And I'm so honored to have spoken with you. I'm so honored to have been in the company of these amazing women panelists. Uh, good luck and join open source. Thank you so much. Thanks Priyanka, I think it's my turn. Um, like everyone said, so thrilled to have everybody here. Um, at our conferences for the last several years, we've been hosting women in open source lunches, and we've been thrilled with the turnout, but this is 
this is more than I could have imagined. So I'm really pleased to be part of this. Um, my name is Mary Campbell. I work, I manage the corporate training solutions for the Linux Foundation. And um, I'm just going to spend about five minutes talking about the training and maybe how you can gain access to the training. Um, we, run a, we run a survey every year called the Open Source Jobs Report. And you'll be interested to know that the number one highest motivator for people in open source is salary, which rightfully so, there is a lot of opportunity for salary. But the number two is the ability to work on new and exciting projects. And there are many. You can tell from the examples of my fellow panelists that there's incredible jobs in open source and a lot of really cool stuff going on. Um, the mission here at the Linux Foundation is to advance, promote, and protect open source computing. We started that with the Linux operating system many years ago, but since then have become home to over 200 open source projects. Uh, it's our ability to provide a neutral home so that the imperative that open source remain non-competitive can do so and the success of the solutions can prevail uh, in a neutral territory. Um, with that too, um, as part of the advanced promote and protect the solutions, we need to have training out there. We need, these are all new solutions. The skills don't already exist. So we work very, very closely with the projects as they come on board to make sure that we can quickly develop the training solutions that are going to enable adoption because people have to get comfortable with the philosophy or the terminology or the, the place for that software in the stack. Um, so it fosters adoption, it enables implementation, and then of course it's going to enable ongoing maintenance of these solutions. So training is imperative, and because it doesn't already exist, we need to come to market with it quickly. Um, corporations are adopting it readily, they understand the imperative as well. Um, and then we also have certifications. So certifications show the mastery of the concepts and give employers and employees the confidence that they have mastered the con concepts and can be left to take care of what needs to be done. Um, so here at the Linux Foundation, we have many ways of gaining access to training. We have a pretty robust library of free courses. Um, there's a link in the chat and we'll provide it again, but there is a, a library right now of 22 free classes that give you introduction to Kubernetes, introduction to cloud infrastructure technologies, introduction to Hyperledger. These are classes that are good for someone who's never even seen the command line, who maybe doesn't even know what Linux is. Um, they start out with the terminology and explain the, the place for this particular solution, and then they go into, by the end, having you possibly at the command line, definitely have you performing labs. Um, but it's for any, any level of competency. Um, from there, we have a really big library of e-learning, and then we also have instructor-led courses in the public environment. We also host instructor-led classes at the corporate locations, um, and then we have the certification exams. The certification exams can be taken from anywhere, anytime, from home, generally, um, as long as it's a private location with reliable internet. So we make it very easy to schedule and to be able to get this done. Um, what else can I tell you? The, um, um, I guess the best next thing, I, I know I'm going to do the same thing that Priyanka did, but I'm going to do a real quick screen share because I just want to show you some logos that kind of give you a feel for um, what I'm talking about. So this is just some quick logos of some of our projects. Again, we work very closely with the projects to come out with the training provided to meet it, or necessary to support them. And then we have um, in the training, again, we have online training, instructor led training, free training. Um, here's some quick logos and certifications. So right now we have certifications for Linux and Kubernetes and Hyperledger and Cloud Foundry and Node.js. Employers are using these certifications, by the way. Um, they're looking for them on the resume. They're using them as a pre-qualifier to coming into employ. Um, and then they're buying them in bulk to give them to their own teams. So the certifications carry a lot of weight in the industry. 
Um, the last slide that I wanted to show you, which we'll also put in the chat, is we are offering a 20% discount on any training to anyone who is attending this, this conference. So um, if you want to make a quick note of this, it's a case sensitive coupon code, but again, I'll also throw it in the chat for you. Just wanted to share that real quick. And I think that's pretty much it for me as far as what I wanted to share with you, um, but I'm open to questions. All right. And I think that we are ready to do some live Q&A now. We've had a very active Q&A box. So um, let's see. So the first question is, um, what is your advice for someone working full time who wants to contribute to open source? And how do you navigate that in terms of employment, especially if, it, if your employer prevents development outside of work because of non-disclosure agreements, non-competition, et cetera? So who wants to take a stab at that? I speak specifically for the film industry and the ASWF. Um, so the, the ASWF, one of the things that it provides, and I think a lot of the other parts of the Linux Foundation, um, is uh, legal help um, in terms of trying to make sure that open source projects have similar and very clear, uh, you know, legal descriptions of what, um, what their use can be used for and what it takes to be a contributor, what, what, you, what rights you're, um, you, you are given and what, and in turn, what you're giving to the foundation. Um, that actually helps quite a bit with having conversations with um, the organizations that you work with. So many of the studios um, that, uh, that are in VFX and animation have already bought into uh, what the ICWF is doing, um, but there are companies that maybe have not, are not yet members, um, but are still going to be able to benefit by all of the hard work that the legal teams at the ICWF have already provided in order to, to to create um, very clear legal documentation. Uh, so that can really help with a conversation. Um, I really suggest approaching uh, the company and saying that you would like to be able to contribute and you're trying to find a way um, to be able to contribute in a, in a, uh, in a way that won't uh, cause any trouble to the company itself. And many companies are willing to have that conversation with you um, and, and figure out what the best step forward is. If, may, if I may chime in, absolutely agree with everything Rachel said. Uh, one additional uh, thing you can use in your arsenal when you go have this conversation would be to pick a project that is relevant to what your company team is uh, building. So every, almost every company in the world is reliant on open source software. I can almost bet that, which, uh, that you are relying on some libraries, some projects, some tools. So pick one that's really important to you folks and then sell your manager on, hey, this is the good stuff that'll happen to us because I'll be contributing and getting involved. So that can be one more strong point in your favor. And now to go on top of that, we have seen many questions come through around how do you get started in open source? How do you make a career in it? And that's part one. And then part two would be if you're looking to change careers, is it too late? How do you get started later, a little bit later in life? I've just busted that myth during my speaking. <laughs> but uh, I would really uh, say that there is no time. Time is right, time is wrong, right? It's just whenever you can, you have the bandwidth and desire to do it. Um, as I was saying, like every contribution matters. So don't think that you have to write a full library to be considered an open source contributor. Everybody starts small. Pick a project that you're interested in or your team is using and see a problem that you face. Like, oh, maybe their documentation is off or maybe they're, they have a lot of issues that people have filed, but they're not organized. Reach out and offer to help. And then people will just like, it's a network effect of like people will like, be like, oh, so-and-so is helping me, wants to help me organize my issues. Great, I don't have time for that. And someone can help step in and help. And then they'll remember you. And then you can tell them that, hey, I want to grow into XYZ type of uh, 
coding contributions. And slowly you kind of build out that networks uh, and you get more and more. So start small. Uh, this is an advice, by the way, I give my a college age brother all the time. And so I, I know even no matter how many times I say it, he doesn't believe me, which is really difficult, but I hope you folks will be smarter than him <laughs> and really just start because Violet, you don't have to start at the top. You have to start anywhere you like. Yeah, and I would add, if you don't have any experience at all, if you're working in a service industry that has nothing to do with computing today, for example, have a look at those free courses and just read the first couple of chapters. There's no obligation to complete the course, but it gives you an, it, it will help you to start familiarize yourself and it, something's going to grab you. Something's going to say, this is really cool. This is what I want to do. And then you can stay with that course and take that on and go from there because the online courses are all self paced um, and they're, you take a year to get through them. It's not like you're committing to a college, um, for your college again, you know, you can do it on your own time after hours on the weekends here and there, but slowly work your way into this is what I'm going to love. Um, and all of the courses actually are hands on full of labs. So you get to apply and use the practical skills and you'll really have a feel for whether or not it's what you want to do without any think financial commitment. Yeah. And, and a lot of the communities, once you kind of figure out what you're interested in and kind of what you want to focus on and start getting involved in some of the communities or even listening in a lot of them are very active in mailing lists and groups and they're happy to answer questions to help you learn as you go even if it's a basic beginner question you can pose it somebody from the community will chime in to help you and also you'll get a feel for where they where the project needs help and where you can get more involved um, then I think we have maybe time for one or two more quick questions. Now, this is a question that affects pretty much everybody on this panel, but um, what does a typical day look like for you working full time and also contributing to open source? And how do you maintain the work-life balance? Yeah, I think that that's something that um, is true in any industry, no matter what you're, no matter what you're doing and who you're working for and what, what your job is, that work-life balance will be consistent and something that you have to work for and figure out what that means for you. Um, a lot of what we've been talking about is how you can make, uh, you know, use open source and contribute to open source as a part of your career, which means it could hopefully eventually be part of your, you know, your work week which means that your choice then to contribute on off work hours depends on sometimes the state of the project, where it's at, do you have deadlines, do you have things that you need to get out and it's gonna ebb and flow just like everything else. And so, you know, a lot of it is figuring out what works for you personally and you're the only one that can tell yourself that and figure out what your boundaries are because open source will take as much as you give it. So it is up to you to really um, figure out what it means for you and where your limits are. And I would say work with your uh, with your manager and your leadership on on your involvement with open source. Most companies have a legal counsel that stood up just for open source uh, contributions. And we need more more women where all these products are being rolled out. I would say that was one of the reasons that was that convinced me to apply even for election at Hyperledger, like we talked about earlier. I knew it was going to take time from me. I knew that I would have to go, you know, get approvals even within my company to apply for that role. But I did it because I realized we need more women in these roles. Um, and like Priyanka said, these open source software um, products are being used in every company. So you think about it, who's creating it, who's using it. Everybody's cooking it, everybody's eating it. So let's have a say in how it gets built out because it's going to impact and affect everybody. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I would urge you all to, you know, look at how you can get engaged. It doesn't have to be, you don't have to sign up to do something really more than you can deliver. Um, but everybody has something to bring to the table. And most importantly, you know, work with your leadership team on your engagement. Um, the next question was, um, what do you recommend for open source involvement for college students? 
I can, I can, do, I, I mean, I guess the, the thing that I'll say is the most important thing on open source is, uh, you know, what are you trying to learn and what are you passionate about? Um, jump into open source on something that you're already interested in. So there's like, there's, there's something open source for everyone, everything. Um, and so do some, do some Google searching on, on those types of things. Look around on GitHub, look around on projects and, and find something that you're interested in and join their mailing lists, join their Slack channels if they have them, a lot of them do. Um, figure out, it's, start to meet people. And then, like we said, jump in and fix a documentation bug. Let people know you're there, ask for help. Um, and uh, even in college, like I think that that's a great way to do is start learning about what it means to contribute to open source. Um, because there are some things like you know, like your first your your first commit on on, on a GitHub project on a project an open source GitHub project can be intimidating. Jump in, ask questions, learn, and don't be afraid. You can't break things. So that would be my thing: is you can't break it. We won't, you, the projects are there to help you and make sure that that doesn't happen. So jump in and get involved. One thing to really emphasize about what Carol just said is. Um, you can get involved for quite a while before you've actually done any commits. So, uh, you know, joining those, those mailing lists, joining the Slack channel, attending meetings, you know, the meetings are open. It's open source. Everything's open. Um, so attend a meeting. You don't even, you know, if it's through Zoom, you don't even have to necessarily turn on your video, but it does help as you start to turn on your video to be able to be a part of uh, the, the larger conversation. Um, but you can, you can sit back and listen and uh, see if it's a community that you um, are, are continue to be as passionate about as you start to meet everyone who's, who's a part of it. Um, so I think that it's, it, there are easy ways to get started with uh, very little commitment um, but uh, it's, it opens up a path to do so much more after that. Yeah, I would say as much community involvement as you can. Um, if you can join some of our events at the Linux Foundation right now, because they're all virtual, they're like $75 an event. They're very, very cost effective. But even for the big on-site events, we offer college students a very big discount. And um, again, by its very nature, open source, there's everybody just is so happy to share their experiences and tell you how they got there and what they did and what secrets they know and who they know. You know, there's no closed doors. It's, it's all just people eager to tell you about their experience and how they can help you. So. Yeah. And a lot of projects also participate in Google summer of code and Google season of docs. And there are mentorship programs available as well. I posted the link in our chat to a lot of the open source projects that have some as well. Um, and I think then the very last thing is, you know, where can attendees find more information about jobs at your companies or are there open or open opportunities? Uh, it's always, I mean, yeah, I mean, Netflix is a huge company. So I think that uh, jobs.netflix.com, uh, that's going to be, that's going to be, that's, that's the one-stop shop. Yeah, Walmart is, um, um, you know, Walmart, uh, follow Walmart careers. Um, that's where you'll find all the job posting. Uh, we have a lot of jobs in the U.S. and in our India location as well. We are located in Bangalore in India. I am looking for engineers, product managers, scrum masters. We have all kind of roles. I would say uh, the CNCF has a job board for cloud native opportunities that are, you know, from multiple companies. And um, you're welcome. Like here it is. It's jobs.cncf.io, just like the Slack is slack.cncf.io. So there's lots of options here. You can take a look and see if you find anything useful. Linux Foundation has a career site too, and I would just say check it every couple of weeks and not every couple of months because jobs get filled immediately, but new jobs post immediately. So it's kind of a revolving door, and I would just urge you to check it constantly. Of course, ILM also has a career site. If you go to ILM.com, there's a link in the upper right corner that says careers. Just click on that. Um, that'll take you to the ILM specific roles. Uh, there's also a ton of roles within Lucasfilm, our parent company, and then their parent company at Disney. Um, so, you know, Disney has a huge swath of engineering roles and every, every part of the engineering um, organization uses open source. Okay, well with that, thank you everybody for attending and hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Um, and hopefully we'll, we hope to see you in some of the communities.
Thanks, everyone. Bye. So nice Thank meeting you. everyone. Thanks, everybody.